Man, I wish I had a, a remote for the camera. Oh, that'd be amazing, right? Then we never have to stand up again. Two fat guys died today. Oh my god, what happened? I don't know. Box of General Sewers was found nearby. Oh, everything's heavy. Everything is heavy. Hey, we're two fat guys. And we just continued to watch the Disney Renaissance. Uh, we left off last video with the early part of the Disney Renaissance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, and now we're on to the the later stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, still strong in the Disney Renaissance. Yeah, like in my in my brain, I, I sort of think of this as the lesser films of the Renaissance, but that's not fair. That's really just because I think when I grew up and yeah, because Aladdin and Lion King and Beauty and the Beast are so strongly associated with the films I loved as a child, and they're all so tightly. Packed mm -hmm. uh, right up against each other, that uh, it it does kind of cast a shadow on the rest of them. Yeah, but my that doesn't by any way say these films are actually bad. They're actually amazing, no. very good films. Um, there was a little downward trend in sort of the box office returns comparatively, but I mean, Three Pharaohs, like Lion King, was bonkers business at the box office. Yeah. So uh, these were uh, Pocahontas, mm -hmm. uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, Hercules, Mulan, and Tarzan. Yeah, so the first couple, Pocahontas, Hunchback, and I think maybe even Hercules started to do a little down, downward trend on the money, but Mulan, and by the time I got Tarzan, Tarzan was doing, Tarzan I think was like the second all-time behind Lion King for a wow, while. Wow, really? Yeah. It is wow. huge business. Huge business. Didn't have any of my dollars. No, didn't have any either. Not a single dollar of mine. Um, it's a shame, you were a very rich 12-year-old at the time. <laughs> Strutting around and making my decisions at the yes. box office. Yes. Uh, so let's start with Pocahontas. First one came out in 1995, uh, just a year after Lion King. It's funny, actually. Disney thought this was going to be their big art house, like everyone amazed with picture. They thought Lion King was kind of a throwaway picture. Uh, yeah, I so, guess it's just a bunch of uh, lions. This is a historical figure. Yeah, so like all the, all their big animators and like the big time names were really thrown onto Pocahontas, and then like Lion King, they're like, yeah, whatever. Like it's another animal picture, and like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they were a little shocked at the performances. So then they thought, oh man, Lion King to that. We didn't see Pocahontas. And then it did okay. It did all right. Uh, it's a good bit. It looks gorgeous, as always. The start with starts with the uh, in Europe with the uh, East Indian Company. Yes. And oh, then yeah. it's uh, and then zo the zoom across the sea over to the Native Americans. Just a, a great transition into the title card. Um yeah, it's you know lush forest. Uh, you know it's it's sort of forest setting again, so it's something we've seen before, but they do it damn well. I don't think this is as heavy hitting as a lot of the earlier ones, because I don't think that this this is. I feel Book Honest is more rooted in classic Disney um, stylistically than it is the the early Renaissance, which seemed more musical theater. I could see that. Um, where it has the big kind of show-stopping numbers and the ballads and the duo, like where it has mm -hmm. a lot of those. I can't really think of a big impactful spectacle thing in Pocahontas, which is fine. It's not really what it's going for. Mm -hmm. But I think to me that's one thing that separates it from something like Lion King, Beauty and the Beast. That's fair. It does have two really great moments that I love, and musically anyways. Um like so, well, I'll stay, like that, that, that sweeping shot at the beginning, I think, is is very gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, it's not the Lion King, but it's not you know, but it's still a very great opening shot. You know, I'd say it's even better than sort of Aladdin opening things like that. Yeah. Um, but I love the song "Mine" because it's about song. mining gold and it's about mining gold and about possessing things, and it's just the perfect song. And I, the choreography is great, the visuals in it are great, uh, and it's just musically very rewarding, satisfying song. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I also love the. Um, Savages song, which I think of the, you know, it's the hardest singing moment of the film is when the, basically the colonials are talking about how the Native Americans are savages and the right. Americans are talking yes. about how the colonials are savages. So really, it's the song where you find out that ignorance is the villain of the piece, um, and so the, it's just the lyrics are super smart and it's just the sinister tone and it hits everything right and it gives you the sense of dread that you should feel about this horrible situation. Yes. Uh, but nothing, nothing like Mufasa's death. I mean, nothing where you and I stop breathing. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, which is not to fault the film. I mean, it's hard to get that. You know, and there are, many films don't have that effect on me. So exactly. Yeah. I was like, there's, there's no like um, friend like me, just like big uplifting. Mm -hmm. Let's go get a moment because that's not 
that has no place in it. I'm not. I'm not saying it needs that. Yeah, I mean, uh, just you know, a lot of historians things. argue that what it has already cheapens the history of yes. it. So uh, that's the other thing that uh, Clayton pointed out. Actual magic. Yeah, uh, Clayton pointed out an interesting thing to me is that he has a feeling that at one point in the production it, it was intended to be much more historically accurate than it ended up being. Uh, just because there are a few little hints here and there. One of the specific one he pointed out to me is that uh, Powell Hatton. Uh, he wears his, his what's called Powhatan's mantle, which is this famous historic artifact that he would always wear into battle, and that like whenever in the battle scene, just shows him putting on this very accurate depiction of Powhatan's mantle, and at the end he gives it to John Smith, and it, that's what happened. He gave well, it may have been Ralph, I don't remember Smith or Ralph, but yeah. um, he gave it to him, and then it's it's in Europe now. It's like in a museum because it was given to him as a gift after the event. So. Mm. There's a little touch like that, like, it seems like there are the seeds of doing some stuff that's pretty historically accurate, and then, like, so I can see the original story, like, the guy who came over that pitched this very historically accurate piece, and then, like, alright, well, we need to Disneyfy it, Yeah. so let's add in this talking grandma tree, um, which, oh, sidebar, and it's a little, but it, it works for two fat guys, uh, I recently saw a video of, that was going to be like, Vin Diesel, when he auditioned for Groot, he tried voicing a lot of other famous trees. <laughs> and they took audio from some of his films where he's very foul-mouthed and put it to famous trees, one of which was Grandmother Willow. <laughs> so that Pocahontas talking and Vin Diesel responding as Grandmother Willow. Well, Willow. someone has to look up that video later. <laughs> Selena. And everyone. Yes, everyone, all of you, Clayton. Uh, so yeah, that was very good. So I'm glad I I'm glad I had so recently watched Pocahontas for that to happen, because I was yes. like, oh shit, Grandmother Willow! <laughs> Uh, the uh, dog and the raccoon. Yes, I, do want to I was going to say those. Those are um, very, which, very funny. Which feel free to get angry at us and call us out for for contradicting ourselves because the dog and the raccoon are nothing but time wasting nonsense. They don't further the plot in any way whatsoever. But yeah, it's really funny that we're about, we're praising the dog and the raccoon, and then we're about to go into the next movie where we're going to tear apart. The time wasting nonsense. The time wasting nonsense. Uh, okay. well, sorry about it, but the, yeah, the Dark Raccoon. It was just, it was classic, and maybe because it was more inspired by the classic Disney bits, they really dug deep and they had their A team on there and they they nailed it. Yes, they nailed the hilarious interactions between animals that Disney does so well, and they did it. They measured it was an appropriate amount that it didn't detract from the story. It was entertaining and it lightened it, basically lightened up the story when it needed lighting up. Mm -hmm. And didn't, like, stall because they didn't have plot. They had plenty of plot to cover the story. Yeah. And this was just, okay, this is getting a little heavy. Let's keep it lighthearted and fun. Uh, so I'm... Uh, and they go into two sides of the tree trunk. Yes. And become one raccoon bug animal. <laughs> That's a solid bit. It's good stuff. Oh, man, people get shot and die in that movie. Yeah, a lot. Like that's several a, times. Yeah, like, that's that's a lot for kids to deal with. Like, I know we talked about Mufasa, but that's, that's disguised as an animal. This is just... Talking about historical ignorance and then just people being killed. Yeah. So, I mean, good go on Disney for, for going for something a little more serious. I think you messed it up by trying to, to shy away from it and lighten it up in some moments. So Yeah, I mean, it's, it's weird that the Mufasa's death holds more weight to me. Than the than death actual, of the soldiers, yeah. Than actual real death that actually really happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure lions have died. But, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if they had showed, like, you know, if it, if it was a Trail of Tears movie, then maybe it'd be a little more moving than... Yeah, that, that's fair. It's a pretty lighthearted film that ends up with a love story that, you know, there's there's enough there to mitigate it. But, yeah, Mufasa's death. Yeah. Uh, so, moving on to The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Hunchback of Notre Dame? No, it's Notre Dame. That's the same thing. I mean, I heard the opening song. I'm pretty sure it's Notre Dame. <laughs> the Bells of Notre Dame. Oh, it's... <laughs> Is that how many octaves he sings? Is that is that how many God. octaves are in that? Paul Candell. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Paul Candell. Holy Frollo? hell. No, not Frollo. Um, it doesn't matter. The Jester. The Jester. Kloppen. Kloppen, yes. Um, is uh, uh, insane. He is. <laughs> are you being the little puppet version of him? I am. Good job. Yay. <laughs> Bonk. Uh. <laughs> um, yeah, is, uh, is vocally insane. There's like... Five, 15 measures of uh, Bells of Notre Dame where he covers two octaves and it's insane. No, I mean, just he's, he's also nailing the acting. Like, all the, oh, absolutely. Because he's also the head of the Court of Miracles. And also, apparently, he smokes like a pack a day. I always hear about that. I always hear about, like, oh, yeah, Valjean of the Tour Les Mis, like, in the middle of, like, when someone else when on my own's out there, he's out back puffing the pack down. Like, Jesus. Yeah. And then he goes out in just beautiful operatic voice. Yeah, it's, it's insane. Uh, 
That's it's not fair. Uh, he's, uh, he's a monster and a freak and amazing, and he has my respect. Yes, uh, but um, this movie is about a monster and a freak who has your respect. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Interesting. What a perfect segue that I totally did not intend. Uh, I'm really just disapp- I'm really sad that I don't have a whole lot good to say about Quasimodo. I don't he's, have anything. I don't have a lot. Not a lot to him. I don't have a lot bad to say about Quasimodo. No, yeah, he doesn't do. He's kind much. of a blank slate. That's the problem. They wanted to. They want to show like, oh, he's a regular guy, but he's a little too much of a regular guy. Um, he's he's like Charlie Brown without bad things happening to him, and bad things are happening he's, to him. He's a main character with the personality of a Disney prince. Yes, good call. Um, yeah, and the, and the like, the handsome guy character has more personality than he does. He does. Which, oh, that's that's upsetting. Come on, Quasimodo, you got <laughs> you got out personality. I mean, it's Kevin Klein, so it's yeah. a tough, tough. That's tall order. But. Yeah. Um. But yeah, he's he's more impacted by the people around him. That is the real problem with this film. In addition to the gargoyles, which we will get to, is that I'm thinking like I love all these characters. All these characters are pretty rich and have very interesting personalities, and they work in a very interesting way. Except for the main character. It's like Buffy. It is like Buffy. It's oh my god! I'm just having revelations watching doing this video. So so basically, Hunchback Notre Dame is a shop shot remake of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yep. A few years before the TV show came out. <laughs> <laughs> it's time travelers. Don't worry about it. Uh, no, it's exactly what it's like. It's I I just don't care for the main character, but I love everything that's happening around them. Yes, I care a little bit more about the main character if we take in our fan theory into consideration. Yes, because uh, at least. You don't see him be more interesting, but it makes the the it thought makes, of it him makes viewing him more interesting. Yes. Um, so one complaint that this film uh, gets a lot, and rightfully, rightfully so, so. Um, is that the gargoyles are kind of ridiculous. They're terrible. Um, I, I love me some Jason Alexander. That's the thing. I love Jason um, Alexander so much, and they make me hate him. And and the bits that the gargoyles do aren't always bad either. They just they're just so out of place. They're, they're with su- everything else that's going on. It's even worse than, like, Pocahontas. Like, the dog the dog and the raccoon felt sort of natural to that world, even though it was coming out of more serious moments. That, and they're a dog and a raccoon. Like, these are, like, the people who are ostensibly his, like, friends and guardians. Mm-hmm. And they're the ones being ridiculous and not contributing much to yeah, and the plot. I found because they not- only interact with him. Yeah, one of the things I found when I was listening to the soundtrack, I'm like, okay, specifically because they have the song there. Like if I take if I think about everything I do and just completely divorce it from the movie and just think about the bits as, on their own, I'm like this is actually really entertaining. Yes, I like these characters. This is a good song. And then and then I watched in the movie. I was like, oh, that's right. That's why it's terrible because of it's in this movie. It's it. It's not like a short that comes before the movie where you get to watch some funny gargoyles yeah, run around and cause mischief. It's a cohesion problem mm-hmm. more than anything else. Yes. Um, however, we realized during this viewing mm-hmm. uh, that. The gargoyles only interact with Quasimodo, mm-hmm. um, which led us to believe that they aren't living and talking. They aren't magic. They're in his head, and yeah. that's how he copes with his isolation. Yeah, now he's people... made up friends out of these gargoyle statues. Now people will point out that in the end they like dump oil and stuff on people, and that's a valid point. However, specifically, there's one moment during the siege where it shows them pulling on this rope. Cuts away, cuts back, Quasimodo is alone pulling on that exact same rope. Yeah. Which would lead credence to the fact that Quasimodo is actually doing all the things that we see the gargoyles doing. And we see the gargoyles doing things, but we only ever see them doing things on their own and things happening with it. We never see um, Quasimodo during those things. It's not like he's trapped in a trapped somewhere else and they're off defending mm-hmm. the castle. Like He is also defending just in other ways at different times. Um, so it's, it seems clear to me that he is just doing all of this alone and we're seeing the manifestations of those. And it's also pretty evident in the, I forget the name of the song, but the big, like, you're swell song. Yeah, a guy like you. Yeah. A um, guy like you. Is right at the very end of that. There's like this, and the whole thing is like almost, um, uh, I just can't wait to be king mm-hmm. Um, or you got, be friend, guess. You, or you got a friend in me, like just mm-hmm. real big, like out of nowhere magical things happening in banners, which is fine yeah. in Disney. Uh-huh. But then, right at the very end of the song, it cuts to uh, Frollo walking in, mm-hmm. and then you see Quasimodo there with the stone statues not moving and like crappy versions of everything that we see 
in there. Like, like a crappy the, banner and all this, like, that it's just, like, him like doing in. these things. Yeah. Like, and it... <laughs> Quasimodo being crazy mm -hmm. is compelling to me. It's true. Uh, especially because it's, as I said, at the hands of his isolation and, and yeah, for those imprisonments. It makes sense. It, it totally yeah. is valid with the character, and it makes him a more interesting character. Right now, he's just kind of flat and, and forgettable. Uh, but that's not the only thing I want to talk about. We, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about all the other amazing characters. So, probably the best villain. Oh. One of the, like, it's a great <laughs> villain. And it's hard to say best villain because there's a lot of great villains. One of the most terrifying villains because it was he's it's something that absolutely can be grounded in reality. Yeah. Also, he's a, he's a he's a person. Like, yeah. he's not a sea witch. He's not an evil lion. He's he's a person. Yeah, he is a person uh, who has beliefs and convictions and power. And yes, and it's that's a dangerous combination. Yeah, and holy hell, that song. Like, um, we don't want to dwell on the songs, so we're going to have the whole thing of the songs, yeah, but Hellfire, Hellfire is just amazing. It's haunting. Um, it's like, a, it's like the, it's so much Sweeney Todd, just high drama. Yes. Oh, mm. um, yeah, it's fantastic. Kloppen is sort of the, the half narrator, half character, and it is, is, is very good, very fun to watch. Yes, and he is, you know, he's the right kind of fast-talking trickster character. Yes. Um... So, I mean, honestly, when I think about it, like, there's not a whole lot of depth to him, but there's character to him. Yes. And he's a side that's a, character. That's a, that's, a, that's a good way to put so it. That's the thing. Like, they try, I, think, I think they try to give Quasimodo depth to make him seem sensitive without giving him character, which is a problem. Yes. Um, Kevin Klein's character, whose name escapes me, the, the soldier who yeah. works. I, I can't yeah, remember his name either. Who is in uh, the villain's employ, who then turns around to the good side once he realizes that, oh, this villain's insane and doing terrible things. Uh, he's very funny, you know, he has the sort of super cocky machismo that is... Yeah, very, like, Heath Ledger in a Knight's Tale. Yes. Um, uh, sort of thing. Very infectious. Esmeralda. Especially her scene where she's just taunting uh, the judge. And her introduction scene at the, at the where she stops him for donning Quasimodo. Uh, that's the thing, they take this moment where Quasimodo's at his lowest, and they don't really use it to, to tell us anything more about his character... But they use it to tell us a lot about Esmeralda and all the all the other characters and all the other characters. All the, like you we see the, the 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 Kevin Klein guy uh -huh. like reacting to that. We see the judge reacting to that. We see Clip on orchestrating that. Yeah, it's like <laughs> yeah, we find out everything. We find out more about every character except for him. It's like oh no, he's sad about this. He's, like, he's yeah, a, he's a prop more yeah, than he's being, yeah. Than of course he's else. sad about that. That's about all we find out about it. But oh, her escape where she's taunting and you know appearing and disappearing is it's a great sequence. It's entertaining as hell. Oh yeah, and I feel like they had to consult some stage magicians or something because, like the the showmanship that she presented, yes. I was like, "This is entertaining. This is the sort of thing I expect Darren Brown to present to me." Yes, um, and just great stuff. Uh, interesting enough, I feel like the least interesting thing about her is her song. Like her, God help the Outcast, is the yeah. most famous song from it, and I just got, I was just kind of like, "Oh yeah, this song." Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Everything else about her, though, very entertaining. Uh, so yeah, all the characters, um, except for Quasimodo. Yep. Very good. Except for the eponymous hunchback of Notre Dame. <laughs> yeah, which is a real shame. Um, uh, I love this next movie. Hercules. Hercules. Um, another, another big one from, from when I was a kid. Um, yeah, because I was 10 when that came out. Like, that's a, mm -hmm. that was a good age to be when Hercules comes out. That's true. And I was already into, like, Greek mythology, mm -hmm. um, at the time, um, you were nervous again? Oh, yeah. What? <laughs> um, you seem so cool now. <laughs> I know. I know. It's all a ruse. Um, and even as a kid, I remember, like, I was, I was like, well, this is not accurate to the to the mythologies mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways. But you should be called not, Heracles. Did not care. No. <laughs> not a bit. Because, man, that's fun. That is mm -hmm. a fun movie. This one, look, we have a lot to talk about. We're not going to dwell on this, but the music. Yes. Like, we're going to have a whole thing on the music, but... The, 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 the muse is. Yes. Specifically. The muse is, first off, great call. One of the greatest decisions made during the Renaissance is, hey, how about we have the muses be the narrators and also have them be a, uh, like, a, a two-up girls trio. Yes. Uh, um, singing gospel music. I'm like, oh my god. That is genius. Yeah, it gives... <sighs> and they even, they even 
are pretty self-aware about that in the opening bit. Like, mm-hmm. there's this, like, stodgy narrator starting the film, and they're like, um... Who's the stodgy narrator? It's someone uh, big. Yeah, it's... It's uh, Charlton Heston. Yes, it is. Charlton I was, Heston. I was gonna say, I was like, Clint Eastwood? No. <laughs> um, yeah, it's Charlton Heston. Charlton pried this gun from my cold dead hands, Heston. Uh, starts to do the narration, and then they're on the pause, and they're like, um, how about you let us do this? Like, we're way more fun. He's yeah. Like, Go, you go, girls, or yeah. whatever, something awesome that... Not as you go, girls. Probably, probably you go, girls. Yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't too ironic at that point, so... No, yeah. Uh, coming from Charlton Heston, however. <laughs> no, Charlton Heston was genius. Um, yeah, and then they take it and... More it, like, hunk you, Lees. <laughs> <laughs> It gets you into the story in a good way. And it gives you all it these sorts... It you up. And it's, it was so smart because it's, it's, the, it's the most entertaining way I've ever seen just an info dump. Because it is a pure exposition yes. info dump on you. But having them sing about the the, the Titans, Titans yeah. and Zeus and all this and oh what happened like how does this curse work what are the rules of the what's the setup that we need to know like so by the end of this probably six seven minute sequence where they sing the gospel truth parts one two and three you're like okay I know who Hercules is why he's important what's gonna happen and what the stakes are for everything yeah uh, and it's great. Um, um, so and uh, throughout the, throughout the show, the music is amazing. The other songs are even good, even the ones they don't do. Although theirs are clearly hands down the best. Yes, yeah, there's there's the best. But uh, uh, go the but the movie itself is is great. Uh, it's I feel like it, it this one because Hunchback was also. Oh, I'm gonna jump back to Hunchback after we're done with this. <laughs> okay, jump back. I'm gonna put an arrow. Jump back. Because um, while Hunchback and Pocahontas both went for very nice realistic, this is sort of the start of them going for a more stylized look. Yes. This is not the draw every blade of blade of grass and the grain on this stone. This is okay. There's there. It's sort of a stylistic approach. We know it's a cartoon, and it's okay. And they do a great job of it. The the people don't aren't really shaped like people as much. They they're shaped like you know Greek urns like the, well, the, the, the old, like, yeah art, yeah like the yeah the old art. They're yeah they're sort of reminiscent of that. They're yeah, not all identical yeah, the, to that. The but. stylized pro- proportions and all that. And Meg especially. I'm like her heads don't work that way. Yes. And, <laughs> yeah. So it, and it works. It works great, especially for the story. It gives it, it gives it sort of a feel of you know, classics uh, by watching it through this sort of different medium, as opposed to if it was, you know, this very real uh, painting. Then I'd sort of have to hold it up against Gladiator and films yes. like that, which now I don't. Because I'm like, no, I'm like, oh, it's just fun and recce and songs and yeah. cartoons. Uh, Dane DeVito. It's fantastic. What a great choice. So, yeah, a great choice, that role. Um, <laughs> as, as the, you know, trainer from Rocky version. Yeah, I, 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 don't know if they, I don't know if they had hired him when they got it, because it's such a perfect role for him. Um, but, I mean, it's also enough of an archetype that they could have avoided, like, the grumpy, you know, world-weary trainer. Yeah, who's, who's had all these heroes that have let him down. Mm-hmm. Um, that's great. Meg is a great character. Very different from a lot of the, the other characters that we, we see, especially from Disney. Mm-hmm. It's a shame um, she's still defined by man, just constantly. But Yeah, but they tried. But they tried. And also they showed... Like, there's that one line that I, that I love, which is, I'm a damsel, I'm in distress, I can handle it. Yeah. Like... That's great. That's the thing. Like they, they have the trappings of one to aspire more, but at the end of the day, they ended up having her, her be defined by her interactions with all of the men. Um, also, like all these films fail the Bechdel test. Like every last one of them fail oh, the Bechdel. Yes. Like, yeah, I don't. Think... We haven't even bring that up, but yeah, just every, we're we're aware that every single film fails it. So, um, but I, I do I do agree with you that it you know it, she is a certainly more interesting character than than some of the other like Jasmine. Let's say I mean I love Jasmine. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but. She's at least more interesting in a way, uh, especially since it's about like a classic hero. Like he is on a journey to become a hero. He is self aware that he needs to be the hero. Sleeping Beauty passes the Bechdel test. Does it? Those three, the three fairies. Did like you? they are rarely talking about men. That's true. They are talking about. Men. That's right. Good job, like, Sleeping Beauty. It, like that's that is a. They are talking about Sleeping Beauty and the curse and all this and their other stuff and what color a dress should be like. They they have their own stuff and good job, Sleeping Beauty. No wonder people love that movie. Yeah. Um, but this one, uh, what were we talking about? Meg. I totally derailed what you were saying. You did because I could tell you were vacant because you were trying to think go through all the movies yep. and then I got vacant because <laughs> you started talking about that. Uh, so we're just gonna jump into some other stuff. Uh, you wanted to jump back to Hunchback. Uh, we're not talking about Hercules. Are you dumb talking about Hercules? We're gonna talk about James Woods. Oh Jesus, James Woods! What a great character design. First off, I gotta praise like even though he does James Woods does a really good job with it. It's the character design is the the winner of this movie on him specifically. The idea of doing the flame hair was genius. So good. Using it to convey emotion. Yeah, uh, like it changes color and intensity and everything. Yeah. yeah. 
all the little bits with fire where he you know he likes his thumb. I think he has eyebrow stuff and ah. All of the all of the gods, I think, also like the the glow to them, like the different design between gods and mortals. Yes, was very smart. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also just that general kind of glow around them that is used uh, to really good effect when Hercules is Become, shown between when he's losing his godhood and when he's gaining it back. Yeah. Yes, and then when he is also like losing his powers, like he becomes even more muted. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, he's, it's a he's really good visual, human, yes. like a visual way that you can see mm-hmm. right away the difference between those without them having to show him try to lift something and he can't. That's true. Also, we, we should mention that even though the, it, it may not be a great adaptation of the Hercules mythos, it's a fantastic adaptation of the Superman mythos. <laughs> it's a great Superman story. If Superman were like a little cocky about his powers when he first like went to Metropolis, he was like showing off, saving people. They, like, take away Clark Kent and I, the secret identity. Like, this is a Superman movie. Yeah, basically. that's accurate. Mm-hmm. Because General Zod comes back. <laughs> yeah, General Zod's trapped in the Phantom Zone, and then he gets out, and... Yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's all there. So, oh, you're, you're right. Hercules is probably one of the top three Superman movies of all time. Also, um, some... Uh, see, uh, Computer generated stuff in both yes. this and Hunchback. Still, the computer, the Hunchback, there was much safer. They did it for architecture. It was a lot of uh, geometric shapes. This one, they used Had a f- full for the, character for the, for the Hydra, which now looks dated. At the time, I think it held up very well. Yeah, I think the it did time very well. It, looked, it was, it was. Oh my god, it looks so real. Yeah, it's like oh, it's so intense, and you can tell it was different. And it also gave it gives it a sense of scale because like when they do that, like they even did a little computer stuff when like. Uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender. There was mm. there was one character that was supposed to be massive, and they ended up using computers for him. And same thing with the Hydra. Even if now I like, okay, you can do better computer animation than that. I'm like, it gives me the sense that this thing is of a completely different world and just of yeah. a different scale than Hercules. Than if they had drawn it, which was a great decision. Uh, yeah, cause, uh, yeah, was like I said, it doesn't super hold up now, but mm-hmm. it, it's not. I've definitely seen things that hold up less. Yeah, uh, it's not. It's not the worst. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to react to Hunchback Notre Dame really quick, it has, I think it has the shot to rival the Pinocchio. Right, you mentioned that, I don't, I'm trying to remember the, which I, shot. I, I believe a story out there is when he's, he's on the roof, he's looking out, they do a sweeping shot through Paris, and where you get a little cameo of Belle, walking down the street reading her book. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think it's sort of the length of it, I think the amount of, build, like, I have to rewatch it, it might not be as impressive, but I remember at the time going, wow, that was a really good shot, and it was... It was just as sweeping and just as majestic. The architecture is gorgeous. It was a very realistic drawing of Paris at that time. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of detail, a lot of architecture, a lot of people going on. And it may not have been as, min- as multi-tier because Pinocchio stopped like three or four times. God, yeah, this was Pinocchio big shot. and sweeping and the buildings were gorgeous and the art is just breathtaking. So uh, that, whatever Hunchback's faults may be, the visuals are not the problem. So. Uh, so, so far we have 95, 96, 97 with Pokemon as Hunchback. And Hercules, and the next year, Mulan, 98. Uh, Mulan is even more stylized, I would say, than Hercules. I don't know about even more, but it's it's in, in the, the same it's in the same vein as Hercules. They're going with a, a more stylized look again, um, which works. Uh, and I don't know if I don't know if it's just because maybe it's sort of sold that okay, this is from a different aesthetic background than what I'm used to seeing. Yes, all the all the other films are well, except for Pocahontas, but even Pocahontas are very European. It's, yeah. it's a marrow Eurocentric. It's a very, you know, Western society, um, sort of all the inspiration for these films. So the fact that they have this this Asian heroine and this sort of Asian mythology, the story they're going through, uh, or folklore, I suppose, would be more, yeah. not mythology, folklore, yeah. um, uh, the story of Mulan. Uh, it, it, it looks different. It does look different. And in, it helps. In, a, in a good way. Uh, and also the character designs, which we should talk... I, I'm going to take now to talk about, because both Mulan and Pocahontas, they took great lengths to actually specifically give them physical differences from your typical European-faced uh, uh, heroine. Because you look at... You can find similarities... While they're different, you can find similarities between Belle and Ariel. Um, but they talk specifically... There's a great video of Glenn Keane talking about this online, where he talks about when they designed Pocahontas, the different things they did with her chin and her nose and her brow line and how they made her look different to be closer to sort of actual Native American looks. Um, and they do similar things with Mulan, I think, to sort of break her away and have her look different. Um, and they do a great job. like as racist, without, without making it a caricature. Yeah, as racist as Disney was in the past, they do a great job of not actually being racist about it. They're like, okay, yeah. like, 
facial features are slightly different, like um, amongst cultures. Like the average face of a person in Asia is different than the average. I mean, face James, of a person maybe, in maybe James Hong's character. Okay, uh, James Hong's, but that's just James Hong. I like, know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they just did. I think that was live action. I'm pretty sure he just showed up. <laughs> Uh, James Hong, who, who kind of is just an Asian stereotype, like he, that's his wheelhouse, and he's been he's been nailing it. So I, he's been doing it so often that I'm not going to feel bad about really enjoying when he does it because he he's awesome at it. Yeah, he does great. So I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. Hey, he's, he was an R.I.P.D. Mm-hmm. He was an R.I.P.D. <laughs> and balls of fury. I don't want to rewatch that. I don't know why. Because <laughs> probably don't want to. Chris Rockins in it as a ping pong champion. Anyways, Mulan is what we're talking about. <laughs> Balls of Fury Mulan crossover. Uh, this one, it, the beginning, I feel like I forgot about the beginning. Yeah, I forgot entirely about um, Mushu's... Uh... Yeah, I forgot about Mushu's background. I knew she went to a matchmaker in the beginning, and then I, like, I knew... Oh, I'd forgotten about that, yeah. I'd forgotten I, about that just now. I forgot, how, <laughs> I forgot how extensive it was. Like I knew she went to a matchmaker, and there was the song, which I, I love some of the lyrics in, the uh, Honor to Us All. Yeah. Which, yeah, for having less music in this one, the music is all solid. They don't have any, nothing limps to the finish line in this in terms of the music. Yeah. So Be a man. Yeah. Which is internet famous. Let's get down to business. I don't know the name of the song. It's, uh, I believe it's Be a Man. And then, uh, A Girl Worth Fighting For. Yes. With that ending. Oh, that ending. That's a moment that hits you. It's not, it's not Mufasa's death, but I mean, that's, that's a high bar, but that's a similar moment where, if you don't remember, it's coming. They're seeing a girl with fighting for it's very light, and then it just cuts to this burnt, desolate village, and the the sky's a different color, and then you find that stuffed animal from the child from earlier, and it's just whoa, yeah, like that. That like can... oh by the way, this is a war movie. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know, Pocahontas had done stuff like that to be a little more unflattering towards the Europeans than it might have. Yes, might have had more impact. But this this hits that. Yeah, this is a really good war picture actually. Um, I think all the characters are very rich in this one, uh, specifically Mulan. I think Mulan is a very well developed character. Yes, I think they said, um, they said, they said I was like, okay, we're gonna do a great job of of building this one specific character, and all the side characters they do a good job of of being adequate side characters. I was gonna say, yeah, more, more like, character, less depth, and some of thing those. like yeah, but you can't. We don't have time for all four of yes. her war buddies to have the depth that she does. But you um, know which one's which, you know. <laughs> but we know the personalities, know which one's which. They have different look and different uh, they have different personalities. And then also, they all grow. Like, well, not, you know, they all come to accept Mulan. Like, they yes. go through a change and they, they grow closer to Mulan. Uh, also, the general uh, does a great job. Uh, similar along the lines, he's very brash and full of himself, and then he gets humbled, and then he you yep. know, he grows as a character. So they do a really good job with the characters in this, and maybe it's because they took less time. Like, I don't want them to stop doing music, but maybe it's because they had less songs that they were trying to fit in. They're like, all right, well, now we have more time to deal with just sort of writing and character development. Yeah. Uh, I I really like the climax of this movie. I think it's it's the whole... After Girl with Fighting for On, I think it's amazing. And not that before that's bad. No, no yes, but it, it really but carries the, the momentum. But there's no that. songs after that point, so that's why I'm taking that as a cutoff. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, oh wait, there's a, there's like a there's a be a man reprise that's like sung over it, but none of them are singing it. Like no yeah. one's oh, singing yeah. it. It's uh, Phil Collins. It's just Phil Collins. He didn't write this music. What are you doing? He's he's just here every day. We don't know what to do with him. Um, yeah, so there's a brief reprise, but so just with the emotional hit of that, they they don't really try to take you out of it from there. They go, and then after that is then they fight in the mountain pass, but they're shooting the rockets, and they have the avalanche, mm -hmm. that action, and then they discover Mulan. Uh, then she finds out that the Mongols survived, and so she's rushing, and then they have the great the great whole sequence throughout the Emperor's Palace. Oh, yeah. The fight, the the sneaking in, there's some there's even some comedy in there. Oh, like yeah. A little they, bit all, they all have to cross-dress. Yeah, they all have to cross-dress. Yeah. Like, I had forgotten about that, and that's just a great... It's a great bit for this movie, because, like... Yeah, because they... If the whole thing was about a, yeah. a female crossdresser, and then they accept her, and then they crossdress too to get in. Uh, more so, and also because in the beginning they're all like, and even girls fighting for it, it's about being hyper masculine and like, That's okay, true. Yeah. warfare is the hyper masculine art, and like only men can men are going to protect the women. In the beginning, you know, honor to us all is you know it's it's sort of how that culture viewed women at the time, yeah. and it's you know it's saying women are to serve and to keep the husband happy, and they give you all these things. It's like hmm, this is kind of that, hmm. gender regressive in the nineties, uh, yeah. and then this movie like tears that apart and, and changes all that because uh, I mean like there's 
technically Pumbaa cross dressed or Timon cross dressed in uh, in Lion King. In Lion King, and that's a funny joke. But this isn't done just to be a funny joke, even though it is. It's actually building off the plot, which is genius because they now yes. have a bit that is building off plot, which I love. So Mulan and four thumbs up. They're all Sam, so. <laughs> all right, uh, and moving on to the last of the Renaissance, 1999. Tarzan. Tarzan. First time I saw this. Really? Yeah, I never. I think you mentioned that to me. I probably. I zoned out a lot. Yeah, I know. Um, I really enjoyed it. This, um, this I, I completely understand what uh, going into it. The only thing that I'd heard a lot about it was uh, that there was a whole lot of Phil Collins. <laughs> so much Phil Collins. But like, and, no and one, as bad as that is, it's like, still a great movie. It's still a good movie. <laughs> like no, one, no, like, no one in the world could want that much Phil Collins. Like I don't even think <laughs> like Phil Collins had the most divided. D- 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 Good words. <laughs> Most devoted partner in the world, and and he or she would just not want that much Phil Collins. Yes, just be like, eh, no, I'm good. That's too much Phil. Yeah, and again, my biggest thing was that sometimes characters would start to sing songs, and they all could have all the songs could. They're meant to be like the internal monologue of the characters, mm-hmm. so they easily could have. Been like, why can't you just have the voice actor for Tarzan sing this over top of him and Jane getting to know each other. It's just very yeah, frustrating. Yeah, and, and like, so his characters would start singing and then Phil Collins would take over and be like, no, no, that's not how it's done. Yeah. I'm singing this song and it's, it, it, it kind of brought me out of it. Like, I, I was always painfully aware of it every mm-hmm. time that it happened. Um, that said, it was good. Like, mm-hmm. the songs were good. The songs still fit the moment. Um, the movie was the movie's really good. I really like the the opening kind of scene with uh, mm. with Tarzan and his parents, and then um, his, the the ape mother uh, finding young Tarzan, and like like I don't know what to do. Oh, there's a baby. Um, is there? Uh, I don't. Yeah, and I don't the, know what to do with this. The yeah, once again they nailed the animals. Uh, it's exactly what I expect that that situation to look like. Yeah. Uh, also, a return to a more realistic style. Uh, they're back in a very lush jungle environment. I think it was a good call to go back to to a little more detail in the painting than the stylized. I want to say before I forget, uh-huh. um, one thing I do want to talk about since we're talking about the like, really good animal design, mm-hmm. um, the uh, jaguar, leopard, mm-hmm. or whatever attacks um, the parents. Yes, uh, was a fantastic design choice on that because they reverse anthropomorphized it, like they went. They made it more alien than because I think even it, just normal cat. Yeah, because it was the other. So like, whereas the all the other animals that are friends with Tarzan sort of are accurate animals with the, that little bit of Disney, just enough Disney anthropomorphizing to yeah. to make them relatable. So you can connect to them. Uh, they took they t- they didn't even go just pure realism with this. They actually took it a little alien. They pushed it a little further. The skull shape was a little different, and the, you know it didn't look quite right. And your brain went, "This something is wrong with this. This is a bad thing." Yeah, and it it was it was amazing how effective it was, even when I was aware of it. Yes, I was like, I don't I, I don't care about this thing, and I want it to lose this fight. <laughs> like. Yes. Like, it killed Tarzan's parents, and I'm not a fan of it. It keeps trying to go after that baby. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, remarkably effective. Yes. Especially because t- Disney spends all their time doing the exact opposite of that. They're like, all right, we have this animal, and we need to try to make humans care about this the way they care about other humans. Um, and for them to be able to take all of that training and reverse it mm-hmm. um, noticeably was... Awesome, yes. Uh, and, and it was—it it really struck me um, as just fantastic character design. Mm-hmm. A lot of good character design. I enjoy all the characters in this one. Uh, as I said, well, the animals—they they do a great, you know, typical Disney job of the the animals. Um, but I mean, Jane and her father are very good, and Tarzan is great. Uh, the the sliding, the swinging, and the sliding through the trees is awesome. Oh yeah, yeah that they, looked good. They yeah, developed good. some new technology and stuff for that. Uh, stupid cat. There she goes. It's because she's not a human. We it's don't true. I don't her. care about her. I want her to lose this fight, cat. Oh. Um, one thing that was was odd, and I, I can't tell how I feel about it. Like I both really like and, but you made some good arguments against it as well, which is the, um, shifting perspective on who we could understand. Mm-hmm. Um, like. During early on, we could hear, we could understand Tarzan, we could understand the apes. They're all speaking English to us. Yes. But they're all speaking ape. Then Tarzan met Jane, and now Tarzan could, didn't speak English right away, and so it it, it changed how we perceived him. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I like that because uh, I I mentioned that I didn't think that um, if you had started Tarzan like that earlier, like if we just never had any dialogue from them, it was all like mm-hmm. pantomime, then we wouldn't know about Tarzan's intelligence. Mm-hmm. Uh, but seeing him talk to the apes and seeing that he is an intelligent being, and then going into just grunts with Jane uh, helped us still realize that Tarzan is a person and not just oh mm-hmm. he's a big dumb ape man. Yeah. Like he's no, he's smart. He just doesn't speak English, um, and that's uh, it's an interesting way to do that. But yeah, you're. It was it was definitely a little jarring going from yeah and, back and forth perspective. I mean, I totally understand why they did it. Uh, you know, it's a, yeah. it's a kids movie. You're gonna have a very hard time getting people. You know, it's, the kids don't sit down for Quest for Fire. They're not exactly watching that sort of thing. <laughs> um, so I understand why they did it. It's just I I would have played with it even more. Like if you're gonna do that, like I would have maybe. Like, have Tarzan's point of view, like, have Jane speak gibberish, like, okay, all the humans are going to speak simlish when we're, like, seeing things from the <laughs> apes' point of view, and then, like, do some cuts back and forth where she's speaking simlish, and then cuts back to him grunting. So, yeah. like, maybe, like, a little 15, 20-second <laughs> exchange where, like, we don't have any dialogue, and we're all like, huh? <laughs> Just to really, like, completely immerse the, the audience into yeah. what both of them are feeling. Also, I mean, that'd be a funny bit, like, I could totally get it, you know, she's just... <laughs> She's like, <"I>, it's like, oh brother. <laughs> and then it's like, all right, so And then it cuts back to his point of view over his shoulder, and she's talking nonsense again. And like, just, 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 at least all oh, these people are so stupid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just to just to book on this with uh, talking about the music, the Phil Collins. I think the biggest problem with it, like you had, you had a problem with them transitioning from them singing to, to the, his singing. Yeah, if it had just is, been Phil Collins, I would have. Which is a fair point. Here's the problem. When it's just Phil Collins singing, basically what this movie is is a movie that has seven musical montages. Like, I understand yeah. the advantage of, like, if they're not singing, then you can easily montage, like, his learning about humans montage and stuff, and his growing up montage. But I'm sorry, a film can't have that many musical... A film can have that many musical numbers. If you're a musical, or, like, a, yeah. a Broadway show, you can have that many musical numbers. You can't have that many montages with songs over top of them. That's, that's my problem with it. It just... It gets to be dull and repetitive and uninteresting. Even no matter how good the songs are, no matter how good the animation is, I'm like this again. That might just be a problem with the story, because there is a lot that happens over time in this story, like him, like the whole prologue, and then him growing up, and then uh, him meeting Jane, and him learning English. It's and, true, because there's no way to do a song and have someone grow up, because Lion King didn't do that, so it's impossible to have well, a good song. I'm, not, I'm saying, but like that that. They have so many of those mm-hmm. um, where, yeah, like where every big moment where there would be a song also happens to be a moment of a lot of change. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not forgiving it. I'm just saying yeah. that mm-hmm. if the characters that, were that singing, may have come down to a story you're problem. Saying, if the characters were singing it, though, you could have had them sing through a montage and it would have felt less jarring. I agree. It would have felt less... Less jarring if if Tarzan is singing straight like strange like me, which I love that song. Which if Tarzan sang it, it it would be up there on the list for me in terms of favorite Disney songs. Um, I mean, it'd be so easy for him to sing it while he's sing- like we're gonna understand that Jane doesn't hear him singing if he is singing it while she's like going through slides and talking. He's holding a yeah. book and you know I'm I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna understand what's going yeah. on. That's weird. He sang that one line of a song and then twenty years later he finished the line. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, because they do that on stage, I mm-hmm. assume. Yes, yeah. all of the songs are sung by characters. Yes, on uh, the stage production. I really want to so. see. This. I haven't seen it. Sadly, I really want to see the stage production. Uh, they, I hear it's very impressive. I hear the the prologue's amazing. They they wreck the ship and they set, they set up the treehouse and they do all this crazy stuff. That's insane. Yeah, I really want to see it. Um, so that's the end of the Disney Renaissance. Finished off five years in a row: ninety five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, so yeah, it's from nineteen eighty nine to nineteen ninety nine. Just it's a hell of a ten years. It's a hell of a ten years, right? It's yeah, it's ten films up and down. That's astounding. Um, as you might imagine, this happened. The Disney Renaissance led to a lot of copycats. They're like, "Oh, this is successful. We're all going to do this. We're all doing this right." So a, a huge increase in both animated films and also some specifically animated musicals. Uh, pretty much all the studios are doing it. Fox uh, came out with Anastasia, and they did Titan A.E. Anastasia, which was such a Disney clone that. Still to this day, people think that it was a Disney movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, Turner Animation Studios did the Page Master and Cats Don't Dance, which Page I know you Master. don't know. Yeah, right. 
I my, the page master. My aunt took me to say the page master, and I got a poster, and I was super excited. I think I still have that on VHS. Nice it's like on my shelf. Nice, um, page master and cats don't dance, which I enjoy. It's it's a it, it's a very mus it's a very like uh, Disney musical with anthropomorphized animals talking to humans. So it's, it's Aristocats. It's a lot. It's very enjoyable. It's it's so much different because the cats all like everyone knows cats talk. It's like a Hollywood. It's, huh. it's kind of a Roger Rabbit in the send up of Hollywood, but also like. Yeah, Aristocats, and there's a lot of influences there that's really good. Um, Warner Brothers did Quest for Camelot, which was very poorly received. It was a musical sort of uh, a fairy tale. Uh, some good ones. Was Prince... that the one where Merlin fights Mem? And there's the constant. Not, not... Yeah, that's the one. You nailed it, buddy. Way to go. Um, then uh, DreamWorks started doing this time. They said some good ones. They said they did Prince of Egypt. That's a good one. Uh, yeah, another one that people uh -huh. think is Disney. Uh uh, and then there were a few other studios that did did some. Uh, I mean, South Park movie came out this time, which I mean that was because this, wow, it totally did. Didn't that it? that yeah, it was ninety nine, I think. Yeah, that was this. I mean, right. That was the success of South Park. I'm not trying to take anything away, but I have a feeling that they had a much easier time selling. I think Dream, not DreamWorks, uh, Paramount was the studio. They had a much easier time selling Paramount on a animated musical because Disney had been just printing money for the past ten years. Uh, and then the Swan Princess, which I hadn't even heard of until I was. Reading things. I've heard it, of that. It was also it was it was it was it. remarked in one of the like very bad Disney clones was Swan Princess. Um, when was Last Unicorn? I don't know. This is after Troll in Central Simple. Park. Um, yeah, I mean, and throughout the '90s, Don Bluth continued to do some things. I believe his studio by the end of the Renaissance, his studio had gone out of business or defunct or it had purchased or it was no longer in operation. I know that much of it. Um, but yeah, Disney, especially when we started talking about these, these movies are all great. Yeah. And like, I think about them less in my brain. I'm like, oh, yeah, they're, that's the the other, they're the other in the Renaissance. Yes. But that's not fair at all. The Apocrypha. The <laughs> Apocrypha. Or the not as good. Um, I think we talked about these just as long, if not longer, than the first five. Because, yep. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff going on. Uh, so that that is sadly, sadly it for the Renaissance. Um However, coming up, we're going to do the post Renaissance Disney, which, which is again solid, pretty solid. Spoiler alert! Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna find some better quality than you would anticipate there, um, and we'll talk about that in our next video, though. So for now, thank you guys for watching. We're two fat guys, and sorry for wasting your time. Gun hands. <laughs> no, we came up with that so we'd stop doing gun hands. I can't. I'm contractually <laughs> obligated. To who? No, 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 is it Fox? Is it yet another Disney Fox dispute? Mm -hmm. It's like, alright, I'm allowed to do gun... I have to do gun hands, but they're not allowed to refer to them as gun hands. <laughs> Pistol meat hooks. <laughs> I mean, that's what they have to refer to them, and they can't reference my hand's dad. <laughs> yeah, so I'm allowed to show my hands, but I can't reference that they're my hands. <laughs> like, these are some hands, and also I'm here.